back to another Arthuria late night debate. Uh, today we have Arco and Omni debating over the proposition that social contract theories fail to justify the state authority of the United States. Omni will be taking the opposition, and with Arco defending the proposition, he will be going first with his opening statement. Go ahead and take it away, Arco. Thanks so much for hosting Walt, and thanks Omni for doing this debate. Also, thank you everyone for listening right now. Um, I'm, I sort of want to say a word about um, my political beliefs. Just looking at the proposition, you might think that I'm an anarchist. I'm undecided on what the best type of system would be for humans. I'm not trying to make the case that we need to abolish the state. In fact, I think there are very good consequentialist reasons we could make for the state being justified. However, that is not a social contract. Um, I think a social contract is a particular viewpoint, and I'll just quickly define it here. It's a species of contractual obligation. Citizens obey the law because they've agreed to do so, and the government has an obligation to provide certain services to the population, most commonly viewed as protection from private criminals and hostile foreign governance as sort of a bare minimum. And I'll briefly go, go through some orthodox social contract positions, the most famous being the John Locke social contract. And this one has been hugely influential on American history, for example. Um, John Locke's social contract is an explicit social contract. This is the kind of contract where the people explicitly agree for a state to be formed and then for the state to govern those people. It's given the authority by the state um, John Locke believes that ancient Rome and Venice were examples of an explicit social contract and a valid one. Um, he also sort of said, we don't have great records from that time period because people didn't write that stuff down. So we just kind of assume. One problem with an explicit social contract like that is what happens to the generation after the explicit social contract generation has died. So let's for the sake of the United States, let's just grant that the Founding Fathers had an explicit social contract. What happens when they die? Locke's explanation is that those people who had the first social contract um, give the land to the state, and the state has a type of conservatorship over the land for the rest of eternity, and that is how the social contract is extended. That's not the case in the United States social contract. The Founding Fathers did not leave their land or property to the United States. They left it to private individuals. So that kind of workaround wouldn't work for John Locke's explicit social contract. And furthermore, no one here in this voice, voice chat has explicitly been given a contract by the United States saying, yes, we will give you protection as long as you obey the laws. So I think we can rightly rule out the explicit social contract, the more concrete sort of Lockean view. So there's another type of social contract that's very common, which is the implicit social contract. Usually these are the kinds of things um, people point to, such as passive consent. So if you don't explicitly state that you are against the government having authority over you, you therefore consent to it. Um, a very common example might be, say, you're in a boardroom meeting and the CEO says, we'll end the meeting here unless people have any questions. You don't say anything and the meeting ends. This is an example of you passively consenting to the end of the meeting. Another type of implicit consent is consent through acceptance of the benefits. So an example of that in the United States might be you use the highways, which is provided by the United States, or you use some type of welfare program. Um, those would be examples of accepting a benefit from the United States. Another example of an implicit social contract would be consent through presence. You merely remaining in the country would be a type of implicit social contract. This is another common justification. Um, and the final main implicit contract, social contract, would be consent through participation. If you vote or pay taxes, you therefore are participating in the state project and by doing so, you consent to the authority of the state in those cases. Okay, so another important feature of a contract um, has to do with the consent being valid. 
it can only be valid if the agreement is valid between the two parties. Um, an example of an invalid agreement would be someone putting a gun to your head and demanding that you give over the rights to a film script that you wrote, otherwise they would kill you. We would not consider this type of agreement to be valid. You're forced into it. It would be an involuntary agreement, and that would not be a valid contract. Um, so I just want to go through some um, conditions, I think, make a valid contract. One, valid consent requires a reasonable way of opting out. If you have no reasonable way of opting out of the United States authority, then that would not be a valid social contract. To quote David Hume, we may as well assert that a man by remaining in a vessel freely consents to the dominion of the master, though he was carried aboard while asleep and must leap into the ocean and perish the moment he leaves her. Another type of uh, way of breaking consent would be explicit dissent trumps alleged implicit consent, meaning um, a valid contract does not exist if someone explicitly states disagreement. An example would be a restaurant. It's fair to say that there is an implicit contract when you go to a restaurant and you order food that you will pay for that food. Even though no one is stating it outright, you simply say, I'll take a veggie wrap. They bring you a veggie wrap, you eat it. You are expected to, play, to pay and the restaurant has a claim for you to make that payment. However, if you sit down at the restaurant and you say, I will not pay for the food you bring me, you order the food and the restaurant brings you the food anyways, you do not have to pay that bill because you explicitly stated you would not pay it. The restaurant knew the conditions of that contract. They brought it to you anyways. Another type of valid agreement would be that the uh, an action can only be viewed as agreement if one can assume that failing to do that action would not result in an imposition of that action on their person. So an example of this would be, if you fail to pay your taxes, you should be able to reasonably expect that you would not be forced to pay your taxes. That's not the case in the United States. If you don't pay your taxes, you'll go to jail and the money will be seized through your property or they'll garnish your wages. Um, and the final, and I think the most crucial point of a implicit social contract agreement would be the obligation between two parties. Contractual obligation must be mutual and conditional. This has to be there for it to be a valid contract. That's not the case in the United States. And I'll point out why, and it has to do with uh, protection. In the United States, the law enforcement do not have duties to protect individual citizens. And this is federal precedent. I'll give you an example of a terrifying story, something I consider to be gravely immoral. In March, 1975, two men broke into a DC home where three women lived. They attacked one woman while two women were upstairs. The two women upstairs called the police. The police showed up in a car, looked at the house from within the car and drove away. The two women who were hiding were on their roof. They saw the car come by and drove away. They snuck back inside, called the police again, said what happened. The police said a car is on the way, don't worry. A second officer showed up at the house, looked at the front door, saw no signs of break-in, promptly walk away. He did not check the back door, which is where the intruders broke into the house to begin with. Eventually, the woman who was being attacked initially stopped making noise, and they heard footsteps downstairs. The two women upstairs thought that this meant police had arrived. They had been told the police had arrived. They called out. This alerted the intruders. They came upstairs. They grabbed the women. They took all three women to uh, an apartment at another place. They beat, robbed, and raped these women for 14 hours. After surviving the horrible events, the women sued the District of Columbia for neglect. The court acknowledged that the police failed to protect them. The court acknowledged that what had happened to them was a terrible tragedy. What they said is that the state had no duty to protect the citizen. This is from the court case. The fundamental principle that a government and its agents are under no general duty to provide public services such as police protection to any citizen is the state of affairs.
the court said that they only had a public duty to the public at large to provide a general deterrent to crime. There are other examples of a father beating his child, having five reports being given to CPS. Nothing was done. Eventually, the father gave the child brain damage. And when the government was sued for failure to protect that child, the government said they had no duty to protect the individual. Um, so I think that kind of situation where the police, the force of protection, no longer has a duty, or sorry, no longer, it never had a duty to protect the individual, means there is no valid contract of protection from the state and the individual to obey the laws. Um, and for that reason, I think that means that the implicit social contract is not valid. And the final type of social contract, I'm, I'm sorry, this is going a little long, is a hypothetical social contract. This would be in the vein of John Rawls. Um, you're probably familiar with John Rawls' thought experiment of the veil of ignorance. If we were to design a society and we didn't know our race, our class, whatever, what kind of society we would design, we try to make one that's the most fair. Um, he only briefly touches on social contract. And the general idea is that any reasonable person would agree to a social contract of a state like this. So you might say a reasonable person would look at the consequences of something like no state, thinking that um, anarcho-capitalism might be way worse than having a state. Um, but what this whole thing hinges on is that a reasonable person would agree. Now, this type of reasonable person has a veto in the anarchist because there exist reasonable anarchists who would not consent to the authority of the state. Therefore, the hypothetical contract would fail under its own standard to the reasonable anarchists. The only way out of the, that kind of veto would be to say that the anarchist is unreasonable. And I think that that would be very difficult for the hypothetical social contractarian to do. So that's sort of my general viewpoints. I think none of those types of central contracts um, end up being valid contracts in the case of the United States. Um, and we can go into it from there. Um, Omni, thanks for listening to that long opening statement. Oh, good. So I'll be happy to give my opening statement. So I agree, actually, with most said in the opening speech, the place where I would diverge is when Arco began to talk about the Rawlsian version of contractarianism, which describes the contract that we would sign from behind the veil of ignorance. Now, I think that this way of establishing a social contract provides us the best route to establish the legitimacy of the state authority of the United States. And I'll briefly sketch out three ways of doing this before getting into the specific objections that Arco raised to this. The first one would be the simple veil of ignorance. Now, Rawls said that when establishing society, we should do what we would do if we were perfectly rational and impartial. So, uh, well, it's, so for example, a murderer would decide not to murder someone if they had an equal chance of being the person who got murdered. Now, Harsanyi famously proved that from this initial supposition, if we take some very axioms, one, that each individual has a utility function, two, that if something is preferred by each member of the group, then the group as a whole prefers it. And three, that the group as a whole has some function that they're trying to optimize, then we would get utilitarianism. So what we would do from behind the social contract would be consequentialist. And given that my interlocutor has agreed that from behind the social contract, or that, that rather that there's a reasonable consequentialist case for the state, then we can, uh, we, we can establish a state on that basis. The second, or the second version of the social contract that I would give is an argument given by Derek Parfit, the famous philosopher who argues that what we should do when designing society's rules is, uh, the question is, which rules could nobody reasonably reject? Well, whichever rules we have the most decisive reason to care about, whichever rules make things go best, nobody could reasonably reject because they have the strongest reason to accept those rules rather than reject those rules. 
the and Parfit argued that the three versions, the three most common moral theories, consequentialism, uh, contractarianism, and deontology all converge to Parfit's triple theory, which says the right act is the one that makes things go best, or that is in accordance with principles that make things go best, that nobody could reasonably reject, and that could be universally willed by everyone. The third case would be a social contract point based purely on desires. In society, generally people try to achieve whatever their desires are. However, we're, our desires are often in conflict. And so there's a case to, for setting up a government for when our desires conflict to achieve the most of our desires in the long run. Remember that my opponent is the one with the burden of proof. They need to prove not only that some social contract theories fail, but that there is not a social contractarian basis for justifying the state authority of the United States. Um, now, beginning on uh, now the the objections that were given to the veil of ignorance, the reason why we could allegedly could not sign a social contract from behind the veil of ignorance was that there are certain rational anarchists. And yet, the fact of rational anarchists proves that it can be justified. And yet, when we're talking about what we would do from behind the veil of ignorance, we're not just talking about a person who's somewhat rational in the conventional sense. We're talking about a person who is perfectly rational. Given that people have no self-interest from behind the veil of ignorance, there would have to be convergence from behind the veil of ignorance. And it seems like even the anarchist, if they did not know their place in society from behind the veil of ignorance, assuming they were doing what's best for themselves, they had an equal chance of being any member of society, they would attempt to do what maximizes well-being. If we accept Harsanyi's axioms, which are taken almost for granted in economics because of how basic and intuitive they are. Now, the thing about an anarchist from behind the veil of ignorance is the anarchist as I would contend, holds mistaken moral views, that if they were perfectly rational and operating from behind the veil of ignorance, they would shed. While it seems true that there are some rational, some anarchists who are somewhat rational, I would argue that people who hold the anarchist position are either not, don't have adequate data or are not per, being perfectly rational. Much like I think that people who disagree with me about claims, if I assume that my claim is the rational position to reach in a case, I would say that people who reach different conclusions are making an error of some sort. Now, that doesn't mean I think that they're foolish, but it does mean that they are making an error. I think that, that we can see this more clearly through another example. Uh, for example, it seems very clear that from behind the veil of ignorance, everybody would agree that brutal misery for everyone is bad. So we can reach some conclusion from behind the veil of ignorance. And so given that, it seems like there, there has to be something that we would be reaching towards from behind the veil of ignorance. And if we're moral realists, which Arco has said he accepts and acts as if he is a moral realist, then there will have to be certain things that we accept from behind the veil of ignorance and that they're the most reasonable principles to accept. Um, in terms of the other things that were said, so the claim about how so I agree with the claim, of course, that there are good consequentialist reasons for the state. The state does things like providing welfare, building infrastructure, which provide a good justification for the state. The other, the other, the other points raised didn't really apply to a hypothetical contract, which is the main point that I'm raising. Um, yeah, so I think it would be good to get into open discussion now. Yeah, sounds good. Um, well, so I'm glad that we won't have to go into the weeds on implicit social contract or explicit social contract, and we can mainly focus on the hypothetical social contract. Um, that seems to me like a perfectly good place to work out our disagreement and make progress. Um, yeah. So I'll quickly just point out that I don't think that a consequentialist justification for a state is a social contract. So we could say that we would have good consequentialist reasons, as in a moral justification for a state to exist. But a moral justification for a state's existence is a different species of justification than social contract. The social contract must be a, an agreement between two parties, between the citizen and the state. So a state well, existing because of its consequences, because of better consequences, is not that type of agreement. Well, it's but a, given... Given that it's, you a, agree. It's, the function of, it's the function of a moral proposition. 
Yeah, but given that you agreed that the question that that a hypothetical contract that we would sign if we were rational would be a type of contract, the question is just: Is it the case that we would sign a social contract that results in the best consequences? And I think that if we were rational and impartial, we would. So in order to deny this, that, you have to deny this, one of Harsanyi's axioms. I can go over Harsanyi's axioms again, but but just just off the top of your head, do you deny any of Harsanyi's axioms? Yeah, I think I think that a, I think a perfectly rational person should not be expected to be a consequentialist. I think okay, that is. So, I think that's a flawed view. Yeah, because you said I, that right, so, you said from behind the veil of ignorance, a perfectly rational person would agree to the consequentialist state for consequ consequentialist case for um, a social contract, a hypothetical. Right. Social contract. Yeah, but and that's, sorry, what, that's a disagreement that I have with you. I don't think a perfectly rational person must be a consequentialist. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know that you think that, right? But Harsanyi gave an argument based on several basic axioms, from which it straightforwardly follows that we would. So I, I can I can repeat Harsanyi's axioms. Yeah, but let's go through this. Okay, so the first okay so so the first axiom is that each member of is that that what we're that each member of society has a utility. Okay, and that that right, utility you for me there. That each member of society has a utility function. And that, that utility function operates linearly. Okay, so for example, it would be reasonable for a one half. So to, one ought to value a one half chance of two utility as equal to certainty of one utility. Okay. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not convinced that each member of society has a utility function. You're not. Okay. So do you think no. that? people have well-being yes but i don't think that a utility function to me when i hear utility function i'm i'm taking it to mean some type of their their actions are guided by some type of you some type of seeking of utility i don't think that's necessarily the case well okay so when i in, in my I was... view people are in my view people are guiding their action based on on beliefs and reasons and those things can be separate from utility. Right. We might sure. have so, other other yeah. reasons. For okay. This is this is this is a misunderstanding. So it's it's not a question of what individuals descriptively are. It's a question of what the what what individuals like what what individuals ought to be, assuming they're rational, right? So presumably, if an individual is rational, um, they 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 have their individuals have interests. And we can may, and we can conceptualize things as being good for an individual, and we can conceptualize things as being more or less good for an individual. So a thing, it might be the case that something is twice as good for me as something else. Okay, do you agree with that? I'm not sure what you mean by twice as good. How are you quantifying that? Well, such that a one half chance of the thing that's twice as good. I ought to value equal. Uh, just, just throwing out moral considerations for a second. Just, just this in a vacuum. One half chance of the thing that's twice as good. I should value equal to a uh, certainty of the thing that's half as good as the other thing. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me like if if one person has a preference for something else as being better, that they're going to seek out the better thing. I'm thrown off by the the numerical calculation of it, because I don't think that's how people approach things. I, so I, I think of it more like a Kantian way, a Kantian way where people seek out their own good, but that's yeah, not no, no, a but, utility yeah, function. Yeah, Arco, Arco, so maybe so number one is saying the same thing yeah, as that. Arco, the, but that's, that's, not, that's not relevant to the point. So the, it's, not about, it, it's not making a descriptive claim about what in fact motivates people. It's making a claim about what, what people's interests are, so what is good for a person. No, so hold on. If it's not descriptive, then we shouldn't be using the word R because R is a descriptive. You should be saying something like what we ought to be doing if, if it's not descriptive, I take that to mean it's prescriptive. Wait, what, what, where did I use the word are in a way that you, you said? Because people are doing this. They're doing what? Are seeking out their utility function. Oh, then I missed So it. is number one saying that people ought to seek out their utility function? Well, no, number, number one says that people have a utility function such that 
prima facie, a one-half chance, if, if we're just considering the interests of an individual, then a one-half chance of the individual getting two utility should be equal to a certainty of one utility, okay? Yeah, so I just take that to be saying that a person should be seeking the thing that provides greater utility. No, so it's it's not a norm. So it's not a normative about what they should do generally. It's okay. about it's a question about what's good for them. So it's like this is this is this is a particular point that I'm confused on. So you're saying it's not a descriptive axiom, and it's not a prescriptive axiom. So what kind of axiom is it then? No, it, is there it a third is, option I'm not aware of? It is prescriptive, but it's not okay. making a. But it's it's prescriptive, but it's not making a broad more. Claim about how they should act. Just making it's not making a claim how about what's good. Not saying it's someone should. It's not something. making a claim about what's good generally. It's just making a claim about what's good for them. Okay. Is it good in a prescriptive sense, as in it should be what someone yes. does, or is it good yeah. in the descriptive sense? It's good in the prescriptive sense. Okay, so why should I accept the prescriptive axiom here? Um. Well, I mean, first, like people seem to have interests and it seems to be the case that things can be bad for people such that like if you set me on fire based on any that's plausible account, descriptive so. people have interests people have preferences but why should they maximize well, yeah, their and, and, well no i mean any prescriptive claim will obviously be a claim that relates to descriptive facts about the world in some way they're not wholly distinct spheres yeah and um, that's not what i'm saying here i'm saying why must why should i accept the axiom that people should maximize their well-being. Well, so what it, it's not people should maximize their well-being. It's people should maximize whatever is good for them. That just what's the of... difference between maximizing what's good for them and maximizing their well-being? What? What's the difference between maximizing their well-being and maximizing maximizing what is good for them? Well, I think that they're the same thing, but but okay, you might so then why are you no, trying no, to make a wait, distinction there? Arco, Arco, you're no so. What is good for them mm -hmm. describes a like a thing. I think that 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 what is good for them is what maximizes well-being. But that's okay, not re but but that's not relevant to the broader point, right? It could be the case that what's good for you is to be virtuous, right? Um, such that yeah, it, it it could be that your utility function in air quotes is just maximizing your own personal virtue. Or it could be maximizing your own fulfillment of desires. It could be anything. It's just whatever is good for an individual. Okay? So it, it, utility function here is just a very broad term to mean maximizing someone's preferences in some sense. No, it's not maximizing someone's preferences. Maximizing what is good for them that may or may not be their preference. Okay, so a perfectly rational person will maximize what is good for them. Is that what you're claiming? Uh, if we take broader moral considerations out of the picture, so like, it, so so it, we're not we're not saying like, well, you know, they would kill other people if it was good for them. It's just all, assuming assuming no ripple effects on anyone else. Um, a perfectly rational person would maximize would maximize what is good for them. Okay, I think for now we can grant that. Okay. So then the second axiom is that the group as a whole is VNM rational. What this means is that there's just some function that the group is optimizing, okay? So it could be anything, right? It could, it could, we, we don't know what it is yet. It could be that the thing that the, the group is trying to maximize the amount of toast made, right? But there's um, just some, some, fun, some, some function that morality should try to optimize for. Morality should try to optimize some function for society, is the second axiom. Right, that, that, that there, is some, there is some function that corresponds to whatever the moral function is. So a utilitarian would say that the moral thing is whatever brings about the most well-being. Um, a Kantian would say that, the, well, whatever a Kantian would say. <laughs> a, Kantian, a Kantian would say that um, something about um, seeking out the good of, of an end for example. Right. Yeah. So so that that this axiom is not particularly hard to um swallow. Well it right? seems like it seems like it follows straightforwardly from the first one that if an individual maxim has some moral duty, say, then the society might also have a moral duty. 
I don't see anything contentious about granting the second. Yeah, okay, so then the third premise is that if every individual in the group is then the group as a whole is indifferent between those two options. Sorry, uh, you broke up for me again. If every individual in a group is indifferent between, then the group as a whole is indifferent between those two options. I'm not sure I understand that one. If every individual is indifferent? Yeah, so, so let's say that, so let's say that, that every, in, so there are two options. Option one gives everyone one unit of whatever it is that the groups uh, that that the individuals are trying to maximize. Um, option two also gives one unit of that, right? E everyone in the group is indifferent between those two states of the world. Okay, mm -hmm. so then the group as a whole is indifferent between those two two states of affairs. So, so is the third one just saying that if each individual has some some property, say indifference, and they all hold this indifference, then the the composite holds the indifference? Um, I mean, sort of. It's not, it's not like, the way you phrase the claim was kind of strange. It's not, it's not like that, like, the, th the properties of the individual, like, spill over as, a, like, because they're part of a group, but it's just like... That's not what I'm claiming. I'm just saying, I'm claiming something more like, if every pixel in a picture is red, then the total picture is red. Yeah, so it would say that if, if every individual in the group is apathetic, then the group as a whole is apathetic between the two options. Yeah, that also seems non-controversial. Okay, so from these, we get act utilitarian. Er, it, so it, 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 we get act utilitarianism with a caveat. Now, that caveat is that... Well, hold on. I don't wait, see how we get act utilitarianism. Wait, wait. Yeah, no, I was, was, was going to explain it. Okay, so... The, let me just explain the caveat first, okay? So the caveat is that we map the, what we should do in terms of maximizing what's good for the group is just maximize what is good for individuals. So if you're a virtue ethicist, you might say what's good for individuals is to be virtuous. Then the group, the group morality that should be adopted is just maximizing the virtue of the group. That's not what a virtue ethicist would say, but I guess... Well, okay, I was, I was taking a very, very simple like view just to make it... Like sure. Personally. Yeah, I understand. I understand your point. Yeah. But or or if, I'm not. If the util, if what's good for an individual is to own many socks, then the group as a whole is, will try to maximize the number of socks. Okay. Yeah, and so, how does that get us to act utilitarianism? Well, okay. So, given that we're equally likely to be e to be any member of a group. And given that we're from behind the veil of ignorance, and based on premise one, um, a, a one half chance of two units of whatever is good equals certainty of one unit of what's whatever is good. Then from those, and from these axioms, it can be shown that we should just maximize. No, I think there could exist a possible world where every person behind the veil of ignorance is a virtue ethicist, and then maximizing well-being would not be part of the equation. At no, all. no. So, but, but, okay, that that is true. But if that's the case, it would have to be the case that being virtuous is good for an individual. So, what what is best for me is what makes me the most virtuous. Right. It, it's just it's just the group morality is just the aggregation of the individual. Right, but the point, the claim you made is that it gets us to act utilitarianism. That doesn't, if every person is a virtue ethicist, then what they would see as the moral good would be something like not being cruel, or it would all be about the character of the action, and every person would have their own, uh, well, yeah, so, their own understanding of the character of their action. So it wouldn't yeah. be consequences yeah, of no, that so, made it good. No, so, so, it wouldn't be so, some rule following that made it good. It would be if their action was compassionate or kind, or if they were cruel or not, avoiding that cruelty. Yeah, no, so, so sorry. Okay. Behind the veil of ignorance, yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, all yeah, virtuous yeah, would yeah, not yeah, yeah, be trying that, to right. maximize the well-being. No, or, yeah, I get that, okay? okay? The argument is just that whatever is good for the individual, when deciding what's good for the group, we just add up what's good for individuals. We just, just aggregate it. So, so now I'm using utilitarianism in the broadest sense, right? So it could be the case that you think that we should just try to like 
I, or I mean, I guess, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be utility, but it, it has to be, uh, well, maybe it does, but it has to be consequentialism of some sort that aggregates what is good for individuals, okay? Well, so I don't think it has to be consequentialism. However, I think any moral theory worth its salt will say something about consequences. So consequences certainly relate. Um, they relate to virtue ethics. They relate to deontologists. They are core to the utilitarian. Um, but because it relates and it might be central to something, it does not have to be inherent in the way that I think you're thinking of it. Yeah, no. So, so it, it. I mean, it, it just it just follows trivially that we that that we have to have some form of a, of aggregation of what's good for individuals from uh, assuming these basic axioms. I mean, Harsanyi won a Nobel Prize proving this, and even and Harsanyi yeah, I mean, is critic. So I think uh, I think it's fine to say that there would be some aggregate good that any moral system would be seeking out. I have no contention there. My no, contention is the fixation on the word consequentialist. That's it. Well, no. So, Ar Arco, again, if from this these axioms, it consequentialism follows trivially. I'm not sure how I see that it's consequentialism that follows. Well, okay. So let's imagine. So let's imagine that there's something that will give. So let let's just imagine that it's a group of two. Okay. Mm-hmm. And one thing will give two utility to one person and zero utility to the other person. And the other thing will give one utility to each person. Well, which one do we choose? So these axioms show that you should be apathetic between the two because you're, you're from behind the veil of ignorance. So you have a one half chance of two utility and a one half chance of zero utility. And you value, based on the earlier suppositions, you value a one half chance of two utility equal to one utility in a and vacuum so in a vacuum, in a vacuum all things being equal that has to be made clear in a vacuum all things being equal because we can take that same indifference principle that you mentioned and we can do that with someone talking about virtue and consequentialism is not part of it we could say that one person would find two actions to be both compassionate and not cruel and the other person would also find these two actions to be compassionate and not cruel and yeah, they would be indifferent as to which one we would do and so what would follow is that there would be indifference on which action would be virtuous consequences are not part of that equation we have not demonstrated that consequentialism is entailed from that because we have a possible world where virtue ethics is the foundation rather than the yeah, so, so you're starting from utility no, Marco, to show that utility not, is not, the entailment Marco, you're, you're not you're not tracking okay so if i am tracking you, because you pointed out that you you started with if you have an option of of this utility versus this utility there's an indifference you're starting with utility to entail utility start from not utility and tell I mean, me how it, we get it, to utility it does, so it does not have to be well-being it's just whatever is good from it. not utility and get me to utility yeah. Okay. So what, we were the, this proof does not get you to utility. Does you not get claimed you claimed no. that consequentialism follows trivially, Con and now yes. you're saying it doesn't get you. It doesn't get you does. to consequentialism. Consequentialism is not the same thing as utilitarian. Okay. Fair point. Right. Okay. So this says that this proof, if if we accept these axioms, then what we get is that whatever is best is whatever 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 we morally ought to do is whatever is best is best for individuals in the aggregate so you you might say that what's best for individuals in the aggregate is to have as many socks as possible that's fine but and then this from this it would follow that that we should maximize the number of socks okay um what i well do you mind changing it to something that i would say so for example Let's say that what I would find best would be that the, the action that provides the greatest compassion and kindness towards each other and reduces the amount of cruelty in the system. Okay, so then then what we have then what we would get from from going behind the veil of ignorance and accepting those principles. Well, one, it, it seems weird to say like, well, okay, yeah, we can we can just accept those for now. Um, that, that I, there are some, some issues that, that I would have with them, but we can accept those for now. So then from that, it would follow that what we would do from the social contract that we're signing from behind the veil of ignorance 
is whatever maximizes overall kindness and compassion. And so you would, and so from this, like it, that would be a form of consequentialism, right? So you would say- I, that, I still feel, I, I still bristle at the language you're using because you, you're talking about like maximizes, it sounds very consequentialist and it almost seems as if you're begging the consequentialism into it to start with. No, so behind, have, so no, I pointed out have, a possible okay. world I pointed out a possible world previously, a possible world where everyone behind the veil of ignorance is not thinking of the consequences, but is thinking of the character of their actions and building in a society based on the character of their actions. And I want you to show me how that type of veil of ignorance would get us to consequentialism. No, so so Arco, so if we accept the, if we accept those assumptions then we would be a consequentialist. But what we would maximize is the consequences that you've said that you care about. And the consequences so that you're, 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 you're repeating the claim. You're repeating the claim. You're repeating the claim, you're repeating the claim that it's consequentialism, but you're not showing me how everyone behind the veil of ignorance as a virtue ethicist would then be it. You did not let me get to the end of the sentence. Give me right, I interrupted sentences. you because you're not addressing my point. I made I, the I, point. I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely, absolutely addressing your point. Okay. So I don't agree. Well, okay. That's an interesting psychological fact about you. Okay, so. Okay, if, the sniping from the edges can chill out. Okay. So, if we accept those axioms, we get whatever is good for individuals, we maximize as the group. Now, you have said that virtue, or that loving, love and compassion um, is, is what's good. So then from that, if we apply these axioms, then we would maximize the overall love and virtue of the society or like love and kindness of the society as a whole and so that would be a consequentialist notion that would be about maximizing the total amount of love and, and kindship um no so now the possible i i don't think that you are understanding the possible world i'm presenting the possible world i'm presenting is a veil of ignorance where each person is a virtue ethicist. They are thinking of action not as maximizing kindness, but they are thinking about the acts themselves having a character of kindness, the acts of themselves lacking cruelty. Okay. So they're not the aggregate of a society like that would just be some type of emergence where people would be acting kindly towards each other. But that's not a maximization of kindness. Those are different species of moral behavior. You keep going back to maximize. I've requested three times now not to talk about it in terms of maximization of some type of kindness quantity. I want you to look at the possible world using the character of the action in the veil of ignorance and tell me how that possible world means that we get to consequentialism without begging into it language like maximizing kindness okay well okay that's my so request here you, that okay. is the possible world i'm i'm, I'm pointing out yeah. okay do you deny any of the axioms that i gave before no we went through i'm ha i was happy to grant them okay so so now, now, so, so the, you, you brought up the point of virtue. The point of this is to show that we would not be virtue ethicists from behind the veil of ignorance. We would not be, or rather, we would not be non consequential virtue ethicists. Virtue ethicists are not necessary. So I explained this earlier. Every moral theory has something to say about consequences. Yeah, the consequences are central to the consequential right? theory. What did you say? That's the same from being a consequentialist theory, right? So, a uh, so you you might you might say like no. you might be a you might be a threshold deontologist, right? And you might, for example, like maximize um, well-being except to the extent that it violates rights. So that would be a theory that says something about consequences, but it's not a consequentialist theory because it does not say that the right act is to add up what is good the argument that i've given from it from the axioms it trivially follows that what is what is good um is what what uh, what, what is good overall from the moral perspective is um what 
maximizes whatever is good for the members of the group. For the individual. So if each individual takes it that be, that their actions having a character of lacking cruelty and being kind, having every person doing that would be the aggregate. Okay. Yeah. So, so I, perhaps this is just a verbal disagreement then, and I'm I'm getting hung up on maximization. And it seems fine to say, it seems fine to say that the aggregate of a virtue ethics society would have an would have these these characteristics, the characteristics of the actions being having greater kindness and less cruelty. Yeah, but but so then from that you would get that um, we we are consequentialists about adding. That's where up I disagree. Whatever. Wait, no, but you, you it falls. Uh, so I the take ground. a consequentialist to be very specific. A cut, it's the reason behind the action, okay? The reason behind the action is to maximize utility or to maximize the best consequences, right? But for the virtue ethicist, that is not the reason behind the action. So when we use the word consequentialist, I'm taking that to be very specific. Even though consequences are central to the virtue ethicist, and even though there would be consequences to the aggregate of a virtue ethicist society, that would not be the same as consequentialist. No, but our, the, our, that, that is not responsive to the argument. Yes, I agree that, that virtue ethics has something to say about consequences such that you would agree that the virtues are in some way related to consequences. But, it, but it, it, it follows from these axioms that we maximize whatever is good for individuals. Now, you might say that being virtuous is what's good for individuals. So if you, if you say that, then the, the conclusion would be that what we should do is we should try to maximize the virtue of individuals. So, for example, if I could tarnish my soul in some way, but that makes other people virtuous, then I ought to do that. Or if I could like kill someone, but it like convinced millions of people to be virtuous, then I ought to do that. And that follows from the axioms, and we can show how. Okay. So 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 let's let's say that so let let's say that we have five members of a group, okay, and they each have um uh, or uh, no, let's just make it simpler. Okay, two we have two members of group, and I can do something that um brings one person uh, that, that well, sacrifices so, four unit. How many may interrupt? Um, I want to get back to the social contract. So I'm just Before going to I'm just going, just going to grant I'm just going to grant I'm just going to grant that we got consequentialism, right? I'll just grant that. Just for the sake of argument, because I think this is a derail. It's not important to social contracts for, for me to agree or disagree with consequentialism, it's not important for me to get clear on what consequentialism is with you. We can just grant that these axioms would entail consequentialism as a moral duty, okay? Now, let's point out how not being a consequentialist is unreasonable and how the anarchist has flawed reasoning or is unreasonable. And I also would like you to define what perfect rationality is. Okay, so in terms of the anarchist question, so the argument that I gave before proves that the anarchist is unreasonable to the extent that the anarchist position does not bring about the best consequences. That's in terms of that's just that's like three ways of saying the anarchist is unreasonable. Give me the argument. Don't no, repeat the claim no, three times. No, Give no, me the argument. So the so the other argument demonstrated that we ought to do what brings about the best consequences from the veil of ignorance. The anarchist does not do that. Therefore, why? they are being unreasonable. Why does the why does the anarchist not bring about the best consequences? Because anarchy, as you agreed in your opening statement, does not bring about the best consequences. I did not agree to that. Okay, I, at the beginning of your opening statement, you said something along the lines of, "I agree that they're very strong consequentialist arguments." There's a strong case for a consequentialist justification for a state. That does not mean that I think that the anarchist is unreasonable. Well, I also okay. think there are strong arguments for no state at all. Well, okay, so from so from behind the veil of ignorance, or it, okay. it, it, what we've seen is that we do whatever brings about the best consequences. So then this would right. just I, so I never said that the anarchist does not bring about the best consequences. 
Okay, so now, but so then, then the debate would just evolve to whether or not it's about the best consequence. Well, I, it's, it, you would have to sh you would have to show that the anarchist does the, the anarchist would provide the worst consequences, or that a state provides the best consequences, and read rather than the anarchist would. In right, order for you sure. to say, so, in order yeah, for you I to was, say that the anarchist is unreasonable. Yeah. So let me let me do that. Okay. So so one case, um, for the state is that the government does things like um, providing for patent protection law, which is a necessary component of innovation, the decline in patents. Needs it's not to a be... necessary component of innovation. The, so the Soviet Union did not have that type of patent ownership. They had plenty of innovation. Are you kidding me? Well, wait, do you think that the Soviet Union had as much innovation as the United States? Hold on, we're not saying you said no innovation. You said it was inherent to innovation. That patent law oh, was inherent. I, 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 That's I, a either misspoke, I either misspoke or was being hyperbolic. I think there there's it's obviously possible that we have some amount of innovation. We just have a okay. lot of work. We just have a lot less innovation. The innovation Why, is a no, lot. hold on. We don't have less innovation just because there's no patent laws. I, I mean, do. we didn't have patent laws for millennia and we had incredible human innovation. Patent laws are a relatively recent phenomenon, Relations and innovation are... has been core to human history. So I think the claim that we need patent laws in order to protect inno innovation is ridiculous. Correlation is obviously not causation. You can give and that doesn't list. respond to my that doesn't respond to a historical well, you're, fact you're, here. It you're does. Saying, your you're saying that your, patent your laws, argument. Okay. You're saying that patent laws protect innovation, but we have innovation that's happened historically. Without patent right, laws. So we can have innovation even okay. when we don't have patent laws. That does not mean that patent laws do not increase the amount of innovation. We can can you show that patent laws increase innovation? Yes. So in countries with weaker patent laws, it's empirically linked to less innovation. For example, hold on. You just said you just said correlation is not causation. And now you're saying that it's correlated. That countries with greater that with greater patent laws have greater innovation, but there could be other explanations for why there's greater innovation in those countries. For example, countries with greater patent laws might have more stable societies, right. and that so, stable society might be the feature yeah, that so, provides okay, the innovation. I, I understand. So, in countries where there's a scale up in enforcement of patent laws, there's generally an increase in innovation. Countries that have pharmaceutical price controls, for example, which restrict the scope of patents generally of less innovation, such that a t study in 2005 by Giasotto, Santa Ray, and Vernon found that had there been pharmaceutical price controls uh, in the period between 1980 and 2001, there would have been a third less innovation, a third fewer new drugs. So the state has to be the thing that provides innovation? You think that, sorry, it's the patent laws, you think patent protection of patents can't exist in a private arbitration? Uh, right. Why? Why do you think that they can't exist in private arbitration? Why does a state I, have to I be the entire protection firm that protects me? Even yeah, me? you you can have private arbitration where only people who sign the contract are allowed to use the patent. You can have these these features that protect your patents. You don't need a state to do that. The anarchists would argue that you could have a private court system. You could have these private institutions, the private arbitra arbitration. Yeah, and then well, I would just hire a protection that protects the violator's patent rights. Sorry, what? I would just hire a protection firm who protect who's in who is hired to protect patent rights. Right, and that's not that's not a state. That's what an anarchist would do. So now the anarchist has a method to protect right, his so, patent. No, it has no method for rooting out uh, patent law violations. Because no, it I does. Hire it does, protection it firm does have a method when I violate patent. Rights. It does have methods of rooting that out. It can, it can take action against the parties that steal from them. Uh, okay, but I can hire a protection firm, so you... Yeah, of course. And, and the other, the other, the anarchist doesn't have to... The, the anarchist can hire some type of attacking firm. You can have cyber okay. warfare, you know? But like, yeah, there, there, are, there are ways to get retribution. Yeah, but I, I would just hire a very a pretty expensive firm such that nobody wants yeah, to go and to the, the and we can just keep doing this. The other person would just hire a more expensive firm to 
Yeah, but they don't know. They don't know this extremely strong motivation to prevent one random guy from violating their patents. And so the state has the same problem. The state has the same problem for stopping no, one random state guy stealing the their patent. Random protection firms rising up and protecting. No, no, no. The state has the same problem of protecting one. Law. The state has the same problem of stopping one random guy. And we already went through the United States doesn't have a duty to protect citizens from individuals like that. So the state doesn't have a duty to stop patent infringement like that in the first place. So what you're claiming the state has, the United States doesn't have. So Wait, it doesn't apply here. In the here. United States, you can sue people who do not enforce the law, right? Under, I mean, there's you cannot, like some... you cannot sue You cannot sue the police department for neglecting to fulfill their duties. Okay, you're factually wrong. Incorrect. I'm not this. factually wrong about that. Wait, okay, let's see. There's some precedent. What's it called? I listed um, the precedents to start in my opening statements. I, I talked about the the situations where it happened. And on that note, um, I'm going to come in and uh, just ask really quickly if we would like to move to closing statements. We've uh, gone on to just about an hour here. Um, but I'll defer to you. I know the exchange just started to get really hot. Um, and it's been hot for a minute. I don't want to be that killjoy. But if you guys want to move on to closing or if you want to continue, I'll defer to you. Um, I think we could wrap it up soon. Oh, lost Omni. Let me get Omni back in here. Excellent. All right. Yeah, we we can. I'd be happy to keep getting for maybe twenty more minutes before our closing statement. Okay. okay. All right. I'll check back in uh, twenty if you're good with that, Arco. Sure, that's fine. Let me just pull up that court case that we were talking about. Yeah, I mean, look, I, we're we're getting kind of far into the weeds here, but I I think that there are there are other more salient. No, this uh, is this is important because I'm saying that this. You said that I was factually wrong. I'm bringing oh, yeah, up the court okay. case. I'm gonna bring here's here's the court case. It's clear that the the District of Columbia of Appeals. This is a federal court held that the police do not owe a specific duty to provide police services to specific citizens based on public duty doctrine. This is this has been upheld numerous times across the United States. It's federal precedent. Um, the United States it, government does not have this duty. I just linked it in debate chat. Here's a Wikipedia article on it. It's Warren v. District of Columbia. This has to do with that story I read of in the beginning where the women you know, yeah, were remember, brutally raped this. for 14 hours. That yeah, brutally raped this. for 14 hours, and the state said they didn't yeah. have a duty to protect them. That violates the social contract. Yeah, so one, I mean, no even, rational yeah, person, even, no perfectly even, rational even, person even would agree. Is, even no ra is. perfectly rational person would hypothetically agree to a state that allows that. Look, I mean, it if, doesn't if, even matter. We can just grant if, everything if you said about the, the state does some, it, the, the state does some bad things sometimes, obviously. No, that's not what I'm saying. The state didn't do a bad thing here. The state didn't, didn't like poison people here. That's not the claim. The claim is about the state has an obligation to protect citizens. And here the state is saying it does not. In order for the contract to exist, it must be a mutual obligation between individual and state. That means the state has obligations to individuals. If it does not have that obligation, it is not a valid agreement. So a hypothetical social contract, let's, we can just grant everything you said about all of, all of the Rawlsian consequentialism that you're saying a perfectly rational person would agree with. The United States does not meet that standard because it fails to provide protection to individuals. Look, I mean, I, I, can, I can accept that there are some things that the United States does not do that are dictated by the social contract that, that, that would be dictated by— That's what the, the proposition is about. No, the, the social the contract does not justify state authority here. Even yeah, it's hypothetical about, it's talking about state contract. authority writ large. It's not talking about justifying every single action or inaction taken by the United States. But you're not. I, I don't feel like you're tracking the obligation aspect of a social contract. A social contract has to have mutual obligation, obligation between individual and state. That mutual obligation means the state has duties to individual. Okay. That one of the main duties of a state, specifically the United States, is to protect its citizens from private criminals and foreign. Yeah, you, well, one, I mean, that, that's talking about 
a contract in the context of like contract law, not in the context of a. That is what pay. social contract is about. Uh, no, it's not. It's not about contract yes, law. It yes, no, it is. Yes, it is. The, the form this is the orthodox is, view. There's a 400 no, year no, tradition of the social form, contract theory here no. that we're pulling from. The form of contractarianism that I am describing is the form of contractarianism given by people like Rawls. From that, you're form talking of, about hypothetical social contracts. Correct. So yes, a hypothetical argument, social contract is still is still beholden to valid agreement. Okay, no perfectly rational person would agree to live in a society where the police do not have obligations to protect citizens. No perfectly well, rational person yes, they, would agree to live in a society would. where three women would could be brutally raped and the police not being held accountable without police at all. You know, no, per, let, let me let me state that again because you interrupted me and I don't think you're you're really feeling the weight of that. No perfectly rational person would agree to live in a society where police can neglect to protect three women from being brutally raped for 14 hours. That that is what's on the table here. The United States has that standard. No perfectly rational person would agree to that standard. So a hypothetical social contract would not agree to live in the United States. Rawls would make the case that a hypothetical social contract could could justify some state, right? We can imagine some state that a hypothetical social contract no, could Arjo, fulfill. I, I understand we're not talking the about things, some state, we're talking I, about I, the Arjo, United you, States. You, you, you've, said this, you've said this like many different ways, many different times. I understand the things that you are saying. The thing is, the question of whether or not a hypothetical person would agree to the United States existing from behind the social contract is synonymous with the question of whether it has good consequences. And that requires a holistic assessment of the United States, including its role providing for defense, including its role fostering free trade, preventing international stability, establishing global cooperation to solve existential threats, right. providing but, for utilities, et cetera. We need to, we need to examine these things but holistically. But not all of these and things no, are equal. We, we, and we Arco, at least Arco, agree, Arco. And, and we at least agree that security is a primary point, duty of the state. And, point, and, pointing, and pointing to an example of something that is being done that would not be agreed to from behind the veil of ignorance does not prove that the government as an edifice would not be consented to from behind the veil of ignorance. But that government, a government, a go just a state being consented to behind the veil of ignorance is not the proposition on the table. The proposition on the table is a social contract does not justify the United States state authority. Well, it's it's about that's it's the about proposition. Some, so yeah, we no, can I, just I'm, grant. I'm, I'm aware. Let me we can I'm just aware. grant. We can just grant that a hypothetical social contract could justify some state, right? But we need to show that the hypothetical social contract would justify the United States. Yeah. So I'm I'm aware that of what the resolution says, right? The que the question is just w d given that you have you've conceded. I mean, I, I'm not sure you're, you agree with this, but but you're, you've granted that um, uh, that that the question of what we would do from a from behind the social contract from behind the veil of ignorance, which is a contractarian view, is synonymous with what the, with what brings about the good, the best consequences. So then it just becomes a question of whether or not the state brings about the best. Does consequences. the United States bring about the best consequences? Right. So then th that is the question. Now to say that the United States brings about good consequences. Is no, not no, to the, best, the best it's consequences. Not, the best consequences. Does the well, United when States? When we're talking about the best, best we're talking about we're talking about relative to its non-existence. Obviously, it does not bring about the best logically. Like if, no, if no, no, no. If, Hold if, on. If, if, Hold if on. If we're not you're, talking if about relative to non-existence. If we're not talking about relative to non-existence. We're talking if, about hypothetical society. Rawls wait, okay, was talking. Wait, wait, Rawls was giving us principles to build the society. I, I was talking, and then you cut me off, and then you are going on this like long rant. Okay, so wait, is your is your view that all you would have to do to vindicate your position is to prove that there are some things that the United States government could do that would be better? No, my view is that is that a social contract has certain conditions for it to be a valid agreement. The United States fails to meet that valid agreement. That's my view. I've okay, laid that out very clearly from the beginning. Sure, but if by valid agreement. If you agree that, that it would be a valid agreement if it has good consequences, then the United States federal government, even if there are some things that it does or do, does not do that are bad, 
the United States federal government as an edifice is still overall good. And pointing to Hold cherry picked on. examples of bad no. things that the United States does or does not do does not prove no. your broader point. No, no, Omni, it's not a cherry picked example when it is a federal precedent, when every there security force in the precedents. United States. There when every security force there, in the United States has to hold this. thousands, tens of thousands of federal presidents. Right. So do you agree? Right. So, so much, do you much, agree, like, much like it would you're be You're interrupting asinine. me now, Omni. Do you agree that this, one of the primary duties of the state is to provide security? Do you agree with that? Uh, yes. Okay. Do you think that there is an asymmetry for the types of duties the state has? For example, do you think that the duty to protect citizens has a greater weight than the duty, say, to provide perfectly smooth paved roads? Um, yeah, probably. Okay, so we can at least agree that the security of the state has a greater value, we might say greater utility, than some other types of consequences. So we agree that there is a utility asymmetry with certain duties the state has, correct? Yes. If, okay. if well, wait, there's a, there's a caveat, and that caveat is if we're talking about the abridging of that duty in its entirety. So, for example, if it if it was a question between the state meaning none of, meeting none of its obligation to provide infrastructure um, to people versus not meeting its obligation to uh, 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 like protect one person, then one abridgment of the obligation, i.e. the not building infrastructure, would be more important than the other. Um, sorry, do you mind repeating that? Okay, so, so, the, so I, I accept what you just said, if we're talking about the 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 entirety of the obligation and comparing it directly okay so if if so i would think that the state if like let's say the state was building no infrastructure and then was also not protecting the rights of two people i would say that the not building of infrastructure in that context is a more important abridgment of its duties than okay. the not protecting two people's rights right. it's a so quantitative here's here's the state of affairs in the united states the United States generally does a pretty good job of building and maintaining roads for, for all states. Now, the United States has a precedent in every police force around the country. It has federal precedent. Police officers do not have a duty to protect individuals. That is over 300 million people that they do not have duties to protect. The individuals, okay? So we can agree here that given the state of infrastructure versus protecting these individual people, that, they, that it, is, it is a grave disagreement that the state does not fulfill the duty of protection, but it does fulfill the duty of providing the infrastructure. Yes. So but, but the question is not, are there things that the government does or does not do that would not be agreed to from behind the veil of ignorance? The question is, would the government as a whole, would its authority be justified from behind the veil of ignorance? And I think given the other desirable states of affairs that it brings about, the answer is very clearly yes. Omni, I've pointed out that I agree that a hypothetical social contract could work for justifying some state, okay? Now, where we disagree is that the hypothetical social contract would then justify the United States because no one behind a veil of ignorance would create a state, not a, per a veil of ignorance of perfectly rational people. They would not create a state where the police department does not have a duty to protect individuals. Well, no, so I would agree with you that nobody would agree to that element of it. But right. given, but given right. simply, but given, given simply the choice between having the, uh, the state authority of the United States versus not having the state authority of the United States, I think from behind the veil of ignorance, we would agree to have the state authority of the United States. I and think I, that there would be. Sorry, I thought you were done. Go ahead. And, and I, I think that that the reason for that is because the United States brings about good consequences. 
Well, your reading of the resolution may sound somewhat plausible, given that it's a question of the United States. We just think about what this would mean for the burdens of each side. It becomes obviously asinine. So if my burden is to prove that there's not a single thing that the United States does that would not be done from behind the veil of ignorance, that would not be done uh, from, that would not be done in a way relative to the signing of the social contract, then of course that's an impossible position to defend. But if we want to have the more interesting discussion of does it justify state authority generally, then I think the answer is clearly yes. I'm not going to defend every single thing the U.S. does, and this seems like a bad thing the U.S. does. So, look, I'm not pointing out that the United States having bad qualities means that it's not justified on consequentialist grounds. I'm also not pointing out that hypothetical social contract theories are not a reasonable way to justify a state. Okay, we agree there. You've pointed out we disagree there. That's not the case. We agree there. Now, general justification of a state is not the same thing as a justification for the United States. You presented the standard being that if the choice is no state or the United States, perfectly rational people will choose the United States. That's not the choice, okay? The choice is no state or the United States or Soviet Russia or Germany or Norway or China or Vietnam or Cuba. This choice between states that we have behind the veil of ignorance is much broader than the narrow standard you provided. Okay. No, no. So, so a few. No, it's not a no. That's that's the fact of the matter behind the veil of ignorance. No. So Rawls Rawls doesn't mention anything until page six hundred about if which system he thinks is better. He remains agnostic if if Marxist ideologies or liberalism is better. Sure, but then on page 600, he abandons his agnosticism. I mean, so I, I would say... I would no, he does not abandon his agnosticism. One, he's, he says he's not going no. to tell us which one is better. He's going to say, here's the standard to find the Wait, best this is, way. This is, this is false. Rawls was... This is in his theory of justice. Favor. This is in his theory of justice. Yeah, I, I have a, a theory of justice right next to me. Like It's like four feet away from me. Yeah, I've also read the book. There's a Yale lecture I can link to you about this. I mean, it, it rolls, to, it is not a socialist, it stakes out his position, so it's bad. But, but okay, but, but, but on the broader point, so but in terms of the question of whether or not I have to defend all of the actions of the United States. That's not what I'm claiming. I'm not claiming you have to you're defend claiming, all the actions. You're, what you're claiming is that if any action of the United States could be slightly tweaked. No, that's not better, what I'm claiming. Then that's, that's what not what I'm claiming. Claiming. That's not what I'm claiming, okay? What I'm claiming is that a valid social agreement requires mutual obligation between two parties. The two parties in question are the individual and the state. And one of the primary duties of the state is the protection of its citizens. My claim is that the failure to protect individual citizens is so egregious that it it invalidates even the hypothetical social contract in the case of the United States. How many people's liberty has been deprived and has not been protected under this precedent? I don't see the relevance of deprivation of liberty here. Well, okay. How, I mean, if, if you say that the state is massively abridging its duty, how many people have, has it abridged its duty to? You name two cases okay, for their so others. This is, this is where me not being a consequentialist is important, because I think that comparing the trauma of a rape victim is incalculable, okay? For that rape victim, that is their entire existence. The the utility maximization equation doesn't account for the amount of anguish that person suffers. And there's an asymmetry between pain and pleasure here. So even if the consequences, say, are, you know, even let's say that all of these good things occur, right? There's an asymmetry of the bad things, and the bad things are so egregious and incalculable when it comes to something like anguish from a rape that even a small number would outweigh the benefits of all the great socks and roads and electricity, okay, et cetera, so, et cetera, et cetera. Wait, so, so let's say you had two choices. So you could, let's say you could either prevent one well, rape. Do you, do you agree with what wait, I just wait, said? Wait, 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 w
Okay. So so let's let's say we have a so we can prevent a wraith, but the only way to do that would be to get rid of all roads. Should we do it? If if the only way to prevent a rape is to get rid of all roads, yes. Yeah, I mean, I would do it. Okay, well, if we got rid of all roads, there, were, given it would be harder to travel, you would prevent at least one rape. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm fine giving up travel to prevent someone from being raped. So Wait, okay, so your raped. position commits you to advocating for the immediate abolition of roads? <laughs> in favor of preventing rape, yes. <laughs> well, okay, no, 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 but, but, but in the real world, if we got rid of all roads, travel would be more difficult, and so rape yes, would be Yes, that's fine. We, can, we, wa we had okay, no roads so for thousands wait, wait, of so years. Okay, just we to had be no clear. roads for thousands of years. We did yeah, fine. Wait, so just to be clear, your yeah. your position mm -hmm. is that we should abolish roads. No, I'm not saying we should abolish roads. My position is that given a situation where a person can be raped and we abolish roads, I would abolish the roads to prevent the rape because I take it that there is a pain-pleasure asymmetry and that the amount of anguish someone would experience from rape outweighs the benefit that we would get from modern roads. But, 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 that, but that, that is the real world, right? You said that in a hypothetical case where it prevented one rape, it, it would be okay. Wait, but it is the not real the real world that we're abolishing roads to prevent rape. Well, How no, are you no, saying no, but, that's but, the real but, world? But, but, but Arco, if we abolish roads, that would prevent at least one rape, right? It would be more difficult to rape if there was no road to travel to rape anyone. Right? You gave me a trolley problem, basically, of prevent to rape by destroying, like destroying the roads or not, right? right so now you're changing the hypothetical. Situated at the side of the trolley. Story. This is not demonstrating the point of the social contract, though. I don't see the relevance here of this of this like trolley problem. Well, okay, but derail. no, I mean, this I is just, just a I derail. Just, I just, well, well, okay, I just want you to concede that your position convinces you to road abolition. No, it doesn't commit me to road abolition. What it commits me to is is protecting a person from being raped. And um, if that means that I would abolish roads to do so, then I would do so. But abolishing roads would, in fact, do that. On they that, would not, in fact, uh, prevent rape necessarily. On, on, on it's the, just a trivial On point. the note of uh, roads and sexual assault, uh, we'll turn now to closing statements. Um, uh, who would like to go first for uh, closing? I know, Arco, you opened. Um, um, I'll leave it to Omni. Okay. Yeah, so my closing statement would be, Argo agreed with every one of Harsanyi's axioms. It follows straightforwardly from Harsanyi's axioms that we ought to maximize good consequences. Okay? So then the question is just, does the state have good consequences? Now, uh, Argo ar argues that the state does not have good consequences and appeals to an example of the state not uh, protecting people's rights. I would agree that there are cases where the state does not protect people's rights, but the question is not, are there cases of the state doing something that they would not do from behind the veil of ignorance. The question is, is the state as an edifice something that would not be tolerated from behind the veil of ignorance? Arco appeals to the importance of the right to having one's life protected, but just because a right is important does not mean that the abridgment of the right makes it so that the state would be impermissible from behind the social contract. Arco had several positions, and then he kept flitting between them when pressed on any of them. So if, if the position is that the, it's, out of, it's in violation of the social contract as a result of it abridging an important element of what the state does, i.e. protecting people's rights, well, then every state would be in violation of the social contract. It would be uh, impossible to, to follow the social contract. And more importantly, that doesn't really factor into consequentialist considerations because a consequentialist looks at the consequences. So even if the state sometimes does not protect every single right, the state may still bring about good consequences overall. The other point that was brought up by Arco was the claim that the state has bad consequences. However, that, that would require a holistic assessment of the state being good or bad, given that the state provides for things like patent innovation, that the United States federal government provides for things like infrastructure, which have, the infrastructure has saved about a billion lives over the last century, given that the government provides for uh, protects people's rights most of the time, sets up a police department to stop crime such that when police go away, crime rates go up. Uh, the fact that the United States provides a military, which stabilizes countries overseas, all of these are considerations that count strongly in favor of the state. 
And just because the state doesn't protect everybody's rights all the time does not mean that the state is not a good thing. It does not mean that the state does not have good consequences. The last claim that was made was that the fact that the state doesn't protect people's rights all the time means that the state is bad and it wouldn't be agreed to from behind the veil of ignorance. That's an asinine standard for several reasons. First, it would say that if there's even one thing that the state does, which would, we would not, which does not bring back the best consequences, then a contract carrying does not justify the state. Second, this debate is not about whether or not the current state is good. It's about whether the authority of the state is good. And none of the other possible states that could exist and do good things could do those things without authority. And so uh, even if the state could be better, it requires authority to do those better things. Third, it's just it's too absolutist to look at whether every single thing is good or bad. Rather, the question should be whether, from a contractarian perspective, the state's authority is vindicated. And it is extremely clear that given the important functions served by the states, and given Harsanyi's axioms that were not answered, which from which consequentialism follows, that the authority of the state is justified. Thank you. <clears throat> So um, in the closing statement, there were a few things that were incorrect about my position that I would like to get accurate. Um, I'll start backwards. For one, um, it was claimed that I was too absolutist to, for looking at everything as good or bad. That was not my position. My position was not looking at the consequences of the state being good or bad and trying to weigh the moral value of the state. That is not what is relevant to the proposition either. I never was, the, my opponent also said that the proposition was about if the authority of the state is good. That is not the proposition. The proposition is that social contract theories do not justify the state authority of the United States. It is not weighing whether the authority of the state is good or bad. That is a separate proposition. Okay, so now going back to what we were talking about. Um, my position is not about the United States having the perfect consequences or not. My position is about what is a social contract. A social contract, as I'm defining it, is a species of contract between a citizen and a state. A contract must have mutual obligations, and those mutual obligations must be validly agreed upon and fulfilled. Otherwise, the contract is null and void. We both agreed that the explicit social contract theories um, do not justify the United States. We also agreed that the implicit social contract theories do not justify the United States. That left us with one final social contract theory in the social contract theory orthodoxy, which is a hypothetical social contract theory. We mainly focused on the Rawlsian hypothetical social contract, specifically being behind the veil of ignorance. Omni tried to frame it as, if our choice is state or no state, we would choose the state. The proposition is not about if we would choose a state or not behind the veil of ignorance. The proposition is about the United States being justified. So we cannot use the veil of ignorance here with the United States. We can agree, and I agreed, twice with my opponent that yes we can use a hypothetical social contract to justify a state just a state entity period that's not the proposition the proposition is not does a hypothetical social contract justify the unit the justify a state the the proposition is does it justify the united states this is where omni's use of the axioms becomes important his argument is that when we use these axioms, what's entailed is that a consequentialist approach would justify a state and the United States brings about more good than bad. And that's why he tried to frame the debate around good and bad. And we saw this slip up when he said that the proposition was about the authority of the state being good. I want to reframe that to what the proposition is about, the social contract. So yes, we can grant that there are good consequences the United States provides and Bad, bad things that happen too. But it is not the consequences here that is justifying the social contract. What is justifying the social contract is the valid agreement and mutual obligation. 
we both agreed that one of the primary duties of a state is their duty to protect its citizens, both private and domestic. I pointed out the federal precedent that the police department does not have a duty to protect private individuals, which means that the mutual obligation between the state and the individual is not fulfilled by the United States. So the United States providing benefits to its people through welfare programs or what have you is irrelevant to the obligation of the state to protect the individuals. That is its duty. That is a contractual obligation. And in social contract theory, it must be a valid agreement. It is not a valid agreement in the United States because of its failure of duty. That is my position. Not that state authority is good or bad. It's just that the United States fails its duty to the social contract. And for that reason, social contract theories fail to justify the state authority of the United States. All right, wonderful debate, guys. Thank you so much for uh, coming out. Um, we're going to go ahead and put out the poll now. If you were here for 75% of the debate, you should be eligible to uh, vote. The only two people here.